Welcome to the Enterprise Month in Review. We have Dr. Pepper Brand Ambassador Brian Summer joining me today. How are we doing? Uh, very well. Very well. Thank you. And uh, welcome to the Generative AI Fan Club. I'm actually just just kidding. That's just to make sure everyone's awake out there. Uh, if John, you're looking you for that, you're at the, the, you're at the wrong you've meeting for that. Trans, yeah, you've heard about the transformative power of generative AI. I think. Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 I refer to automagical AI in one of my recent columns, and I got a lot of compliments for that. So... Uh, so yeah, let's let's have a look. We got a we got a good agenda today, Brian. Actually, what I skipped our overview. This is the month in review. Look, we got we got Thomas Otter coming up, so we got to be on our toes today. And we're, Tom's going to have to answer for the big ideas in HR. Where the hell are they? So that's that's going to be fun to see if he can feel that one. So so you and I, we got to make quick work of our uh, of our top picks so we can get Thomas in the chair there. So sure. So yeah, welcome to everyone. Uh, hopefully you have, Brian and I are kind of in uh, AI detox mode, actually, from a whirlwind series of events. And hopefully you got lots of fresh comments for us about what you've seen on the show circuit. So if you're in the chat, start start typing away. And uh, Brian, where do you want to begin here? Shall we start with uh, some cringe? What do you got? Cringy buzzwords. Yeah, so I saw... The I had not seen the word proletariat until this week. And then this week, it just blew up everywhere. And, uh, you know. And, so am uh, I, I feel like I'm part of the proletariat. Is that? Oh, yeah. You're the bro hammer. According oh, excellent. To the players. Uh, Man. You know, you're the bro hammer who's excellent. part of the proletariat. And that's what's wrong with uh, tech today. It's a, it's a proletariat. What the world fuck is the proletariat anyway? Yeah, so someone's out there pimping that name, uh, that term, like crazy in the last week, and hopefully it will disappear and die away just as fast as it showed up. But the other thing that surprised me, if we, you bounce to the next one, is someone on um, on uh, Twitter posted this, and granted, it's got a, more, a little bit of a marketing twist to it, but it sure did feel to me like they were going after the buzzword generator tool that we had, or the marketing tagline generator we have on our annual unpredictions list that we've been doing now what seven or eight years and uh, you can see there's here uh, in, uh, oh, apologies to everybody it looks like uh, the font took a beating uh, when it got resized for um stream yard here but uh you know there were some new <laughs> newish kind of words but it was it was helpful to see this uh, listing just because you now know where all the marketers get the copy for their, uh, you know, screaming headlines about generative AI. The big question is whether chat GPT has been trained on the unpredictions. We're going to have to investigate that a little bit uh, <laughs> and see if some of our <laughs> unique crafted buzzwords have shown up there. If they have been, we're personally going to be responsible for all kinds of hallucinations and other kinds of terrible, you know, side effects uh, showing up as a, as a result of the training on those uh, unprediction. Hmm. Indeed. All right. So shall we hit our picks? Sure. What do we got? You're up first, John. All right. Wow. I love that. Love those chimes. That's, that's really nice. Um, so Gen AI boom eludes enterprise software for now. Uh, I could have picked a few different articles for this. I chose this one from Constellation's Larry Dignan. There was another good one from Joe McKendrick over at CDNet. Joe's was called uh, Generative AI. Uh, whoops, ZDNet cookies are blocking the title. Thanks a lot. Generative AI may be creating more work than it saves. Um, these kinds of cautionary articles, I think, are, are really important right now for, for customers as they evaluate this technology. So kudos to these authors for keeping it real and documenting with data some of the struggles that have been happening. And I thought one of the most interesting juxtapositions I found was, was looking at N NVIDIA's surging stock price. Of course, it's really nice to sell shovels during a gold rush. And then... Uh, looking at the major retailers, a couple of them, including Target and Macy's that Stuart Lachlan had covered in Digenomica, both of whom are having struggles, particularly Macy's. Um, needless to say, these companies are investing heavily in AI. It's just that, surprise, surprise, 
just investing in a new technology doesn't, Brian, doesn't dramatically change your prospects necessarily, especially in the midst of so-called macroeconomic headwinds. And so there's some interesting wake-up calls here to consider, and hopefully, you know, we'll get into a little bit more of that with, with Thomas as well. Um, so, you know, in- interestingly enough, you know, I think the other thing that Larry went through in this column is he looked at different vendors like Salesforce, Workday, MongoDB, Nutanix, UiPath, and the vendors themselves kind of struggling a little bit. I think one thing that was really interesting from some of the takeaways is that some of the vendors that are investing in data and data management are doing well right now. And so uh, Pure Storage, for example, had a good quarter we reported on. So I think it's interesting because there's this whole thing around AI preparedness is a real thing. And so vendors who are helping with that, Sales, Salesforce, for example, cited some significant growth around data cloud for that reason. So anyway, that's top story number one. Any comment there, Brian, before I move quickly to the next? No, keep going. Okay, cool. Well, this one's just a, a happy, lighthearted story about how Google's AI whims are destroying the open web. Uh, so, you know, any of any of us who really love the idea of really cool web experiences where you linked to blogs and you went and discovered new blogs and you did all that legwork to find new ideas. Well, you know, that was nice. But but now Google's going to do that for you in inline search. And so a lot of people are rightly wondering, what's the future of web discourse and web business models in the face of all of this? And actually, this is not an overnight thing. This is something that's been building for a long time with different algorithmic changes and advancements. But anyway, uh, Casey Newton over at Platformer had a really good article on this. And it's just an interesting topic in terms of the future of everything and, you know, whose business models get subsumed and why. And we'll get to a whiff related to this topic later as well. And that's my stories. Brian, do you you want to say anything before we move on to yours? No, uh, we'll we'll go right into mine. I I would agree that link deal of how it ties to revenue creation for some of these players is going to be key. All right. So my first one, I thought this was interesting because um, I hear a lot of vendors actually talking almost with a machismo about how their AI tools would never, ever, you know, create um, uh, hallucinations or other kind of things because they've got it so totally wired on uh, the training and uh, other technologies they're, they're using to make things work right. This story on OpenAI is hilarious because of the things that popped up. Turned out that, well, somebody made a mistake in training. And um, when you train on porn sites, you get some really unexpected results. And, you know, you guys can read this article. It's an MIT, uh, MIT Technology Review. It is an eye opener with all the things that, uh, you know, you know, that old expression, if anything could go wrong, it will go wrong. Oh, it did that and then some. And this story has the goods on it. Uh, Just for some viewers, I think some of the live stream wasn't streaming right. I'm not sure why it's streaming properly now. So if you're just joining, please say hi into the comments so we know you're here. And uh, in just a few minutes, Thomas Sauter will be joining us to talk about big ideas in HR. Uh, so sorry if you missed part of the earlier stream. I, I think I have that on the podcast version, so I'll be able to get it to you later if you missed it. Brian, yeah. I think you have another top story, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, All this, right. This is one where um, it's really kind of sad when you think about how bad mid-managers have been getting it lately in the last few years. Top execs get all the big bonuses. Uh, and the middle managers, they all get laid off. In fact, the last line or so there talks about, um, you know, they're the prime targets for the chopping block, 30% of them, um, you know, of layoff, laid off workers and middle managers. It's a rather sobering deal. And I wanted this in here anyway, because I knew we were going to be talking with Thomas. Uh, you know, there are some problems with the way companies hire and treat people and I'm, you know, and we could talk all you want about, oh, there's a technology to capture skills. Yeah, these are the people with some of the greatest skills and uh, corporate knowledge that are getting whacked left and right out of companies. There's something really wrong here. And I'm not sure AI is actually going to help these people that much. I mean, it could, yes, the headline says it can make the future less miserable, but, um, you know, it, it, 
AI is not going to solve the institutional problems with the fact these middle managers work for a bunch of cretins and abusive, <laughs> uh, you know, folks. Anyway. Yeah, you've, you've been waiting on AI to solve the bad manager problem and maybe it ain't have all, it's, all of that it's, yet. And I, th- I might have actually snuck one more story or not. I don't know. But um, uh, yeah, I can't remember now. I'm going to take a quick peek on the slide and see. Just one sec. Yep. Yeah, we got another. All right, here we go. And uh, real quick, this one. Um, this was an interesting study. Again, because Thomas is going to be here. This one looks at how uh, how well you'll how long you'll stay with the company and how well you'll do is based on whether the company has a great leader or and or you work with a uh, for a great manager, and it goes through it back and forth about uh, you know you could see the the texture near the bottom. 38% of workers with a good manager and a poor leader said they were um, committed to stay. Uh, 60% of workers who reported a poor manager and a great leader uh, said they were, um, uh, said they were committed. I'm sorry, I, you guys can read. I don't have my glasses on right now. I'm trying to struggle through there. But the bottom line is it's the great leader. People will work for a company with, I don't know, Steve Jobs or, uh, um, or, or um, Elon Musk, whatever, at the top and put up with a bad manager. But the other way around, you know, um, a poor leader and a great manager doesn't uh, deliver the kind of longevity you like. Anyway, it was a good story. Cool. So, yeah, I guess today is tech problem day because someone, Bonnie Tinder, hello, Bonnie, uh, said that for some reason comments aren't working for Bonnie on LinkedIn, which is probably why our comment stream's a little bit quiet. If for some reason the comment stream isn't working for you on LinkedIn and you want to comment, then pop over to uh, Twitter on my Twitter handle, Johnny or P, and please uh, comment there. Uh, but anyhow, um, we're going to bring Thomas on in just a minute. If you missed my early picks, I'll do a podcast version of this. Uh, but we did hit some really cool overhyped tech buzzwords, including proletariat. I didn't want you all to miss that if the stream wasn't working for you. Uh, that that one is clearly going to have legs. Uh, and then um, my top stories uh, were about Gen AI reality check from Larry Dignan, and then also Google destroying the open web in search of an AI business model, and just lighthearted stuff uh, to wrap up the conference season. With that said, uh, shall we uh, see if Thomas can help us make sense of all this? Well, this is not just Thomas. This is Thomas, who was interviewed once upon a time by Dennis Howlett, who had yeah, look at web. that. He had nothing but positive things to say about Thomas. So Thomas must have paid him off or whatever, because Dennis, <laughs> Dennis, Dennis was just way too complimentary in that interview. But uh, anyway. Yeah, and Dennis doesn't generally like anybody. So that that's pretty cool, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas Otter, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Brian. Lovely to be on your on your show. I'm a bit nervous, actually. You know. Yeah, well, it might be appropriate to be a little nervous because because uh you know we went this whole thing this spring i th- and i think it was like brian you you were reaching a point where you were about i think to have an implosion over the the a- hr job description ai functionality that was being joyfully announced from every keynote stage and it was basically an incrementalism ai style and you wanted you basically were looking for big ideas in hr asking every single vendor where are your big ideas well if Thomas Otter doesn't have some big ideas, then we're all screwed. Thomas, no pressure, <laughs> but we're but we're but we're glad to have you. And by the way, folks, uh, Thomas is is now a venture capitalist. I don't know many venture capitalists, but Thomas has well, always had one, the huh? yeah. And Thomas has the enterprise chops that I look for, so I'm sure you'll have much success. And I also highly recommend Thomas's blog. You've been really quite active in your blog which is called Work in Progress over at Substack. I highly recommend. It's a great read. Uh, so uh, so not only are you investing, but you're writing quite a bit, so it seems like you have a lot going on. Well, thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah. I'll even, I'll pile on a little bit. Thomas and Thomas works with uh, Jason Corsello. You are, you are the two guys that founded Acadian Ventures uh, a number of years ago. And 
I I certainly knew Jason uh, from his days over at Cornerstone. Uh, and who you guys have as part of your advisory crew, that's kind of a who's who in the HR space. So kudos for getting that. But I would agree with John. Uh, you know, I, I even got uh, some strange pained looks rather from a software CEO that John was in the audience. And I'm basically asking, so what is your vision beyond saying AI every third sentence? You know, what is your vision in, say, three to five years on where you're going to take the products? Because there's got to be more than slapping chat bots all throughout the application. And, that, you know, to John's incremental point. So, yeah, I'm going to be fascinated to hear what you got to say, Thomas. So, so let's start, let's start there, but let's, we'll allow you to include AI in the, in your answer. Um, but obviously non AI is fine too. Um, (laughs) but, but where are the, the big ideas in HR? What is getting you excited about HR tech right now? So, so let me cover a moment about AI and then we can go beyond that for a second. But, you know, saying you have AI is like saying you have weather. You know, it's yeah. it might be accurate, but it's not particularly useful. You've kind of got to define what it is. And and what I'd say has been happening over the last nine months or so is that all the talk and excitement around Gen AI has been crowding out opportunities to do things with non-generative AI. So I'm actually more excited at the moment around around activities with non-generative AI than I am necessarily around activities with generative AI. So I think Gen AI has got a lot of potential, but I think we've got a lot of work to do to get it right. And um, I think there's there's a tremendous tremendous amount of hype and a tremendous amount of noise. But there is the kernel, the the kernel, um, not Colonel Sanders, but there is a kernel of something useful uh, in 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 Gen AI. But we have, you know, we have work to do to get through the architecture and get down to the, you know, get down to the reality. I think. You know, one thing that's I think interesting for you guys is that if I go back 15 years to maybe even longer to when cloud came along, the incumbent vendors were completely dissing the cloud. If you remember, the on-premise vendors all said that you know you can't put sensitive data into a cloud, and maybe you can do a little bit of talent management, but there's no ways you can do core processes like payroll and general ledger and so on. And you know, Gartner and IBM and everyone else agreed with that position. And, um, you know, eventually we, they were all proved wrong. And then, you know, Oracle, SAP and others had to change their, change their tune and acquire things like success factors and so on and so on. And so it's almost as if the, there was this denial with the previous technology shift. And with this way, we've got the opposite, which is where we have the incumbent vendors, uh, jumping on, jumping on the AI topic with, if you like, with unseemly haste. Um, and lots of talk about revolution and change and, and and stuff, but you know I defy any enterprise vendor to to do anything in six months. Um, you know they can't roll out a new PowerPoint template in six months. Never mind refactor the refactor the complete their complete product strategies. So I think at the in the in the enterprise in the in the incumbent vendor space, the um, AI talk is way ahead of the of the actual reality. Um, there's some interesting work going on in the startup world, which which I'll talk about in a moment. But I would say that the in the large in the large vendors, it's it's a lot of talk, and there's also been a rush to to monetize things that don't quite exist yet, which I think is is short sighted. Um, uh, I think they could have done they could be doing more to to um, uh, to build out real adoption uh, before. Before rushing to 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 revenue uh, to revenue generation, but you know, as a person now that's focused on the startups, I you know I'm not really bothered about what the big guys do. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in in what's going on in the what's going on in the in the startup world and 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 what's emerging, you know, what's emerging there. And I'd say, you know, in HR tech, quite a lot is happening. Um, it's perhaps not. Um, well, big, complete revolution. Let's throw things on the head. There are a couple of things that are doing that, but but there's a lot going outside the world of the of the you know the traditional enterprise, which is where we you know where we've all historically lived and uh, made our livings. Um, yeah, you know, what I've learned over the last half a dozen years is that there's a there's a massive world outside of the 
you know outside of the big guys which is which is often a lot more a lot more interesting uh a lot more exciting but also a lot more precarious um uh, so maybe that's where we'll we'll spend a bit of time we'll spend a bit of time um uh talking um so maybe i'll pause there you guys want to want to beat me up now or as we go along <laughs> i i would be really interested to hear uh, kind of what what ideas you're getting from the startup side that are inspiring you. And by the way, just real quick for the audience again, if you're on LinkedIn, which a lot of you are, and you're having trouble commenting, try to hop on over to Twitter and pop in a comment there on Johnny RP, please. Thank you, and thanks Bonnie for doing that. Uh, so, so Thomas, yeah, t- tell us a little bit more about sort of what the startup side of this. Where, where are the ideas that you think are, like you said, maybe they're a little riskier, but they're they're jolting the imagination a little bit. What are you seeing? Yeah, so so I'd say a, a couple of things have happened in the startup world over the last last few years, where you might have missed an enterprise land. Um, again, I'd say that you know if you're looking at software 15 years ago, uh, large enterprises had better tech stacks than um, than um, uh, than startups did. Um, I'd argue today that that startups or, or uh, mid-sized companies have better HR stacks than enterprises. Uh, there's been a rapid evolution of 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 very compelling software for organizations between you know five employees and two thousand employees. You know we've seen the rapid growth of companies like Personio out of Germany now valued at eight billion. You know valued now at eight billion euros. We've seen the massive growth of people like like Hi Bob uh, offering really lightweight, easy to use multinational platforms that that really compete. In that lower lower edge of the you know lower end, edge of the enterprise, and we've seen a real explosion of tooling for the for the for the SME, right? Whether it's in better recruiting software, whether it's better learning management software, whether it's in in core HR administrative processes and so on, the the advances in in SME HR in the last ten years have been more last five years even have been have been quite remarkable. So you know, an HR manager in a in a two hundred employee company today has great technology, and an HR manager in of of a of a two hundred employee company ten years ago was in Excel, and if you look today, the HR manager of the hundred thousand employee company is in Excel, right? And uh, and so when there's this, I think we're in a we're in a point at the moment where. Where um, we we have a, a stalemate in the enterprise, right? You've got SAP, Workday, Oracle, um, uh, Ceridian, UKG, etc., and they all have their customer bases. They all have their customers, and it's a bit like I, I don't like military phraseology in, in in business conversation, but we are in a bit of a you know everyone has their trenches, and we are we do have the the battle lines. The battle lines draw. There's a lot more fluidity in the in the SME world at the moment than there is in the than there is in the core HR system in the enterprise. There are a few exceptions, and I'll pick on that in a minute. But but I'd say that if you're looking for, you know, if you're looking for 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 where there's been disruption and change, it's been happening in the in the mid market rather than in the rather than in the in, rather than the enterprise. And also, there's been you know rapid evolution outside of North America. So um, yeah, we've been involved in a, a, a payroll. I'm going to push a few portfolio companies as we go along, if you don't mind, because hey, that's my job. Um, yeah, we've seen with in Mexico, we've invested in a company called Worky, which does uh, uh, mid market uh, a payroll in Mexico, payroll in HR in Mexico. There's been major legislative changes in Mexico, which are which are encouraging companies to 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 move to electronic electronic payrolls. That's going gangbusters. We've done investments in in. There's an amazing technology market in Kenya, right? Kenya is the most advanced company in the world when it comes to mobile phone usage, right? The country in the world when it comes to mobile phone usage, seventy five percent of the GDP in Kenya goes through a mobile device, right? And and so the the, the payroll systems and the uh, approaches around the mobile commerce in Kenya and and indeed in sub-Saharan Africa are fascinating, and that's like so super cool. You know, you can. You know, you're looking at. You think, like from the Western world, oh, this is you know, this is backward. No ways. You know, the stuff that's going on there in terms of real time payments and all the rest of it, um, uh, getting your salary real time the same day that you did the work, tax validated, all the rest of it, easy peasy. That's Kenya. 
Hey, just real, just real quick, Thomas, on that. I think one thing that's fascinating when you say like that that they're not behind is sometimes like not having legacy infrastructure is the biggest advantage you can have, right? So, you yeah. know, being able to kind of literally start uh, with a whiteboard can can on some level pay off for you. Yeah, yeah, and if you look at what they're doing with with uh, pay structures, you know, with with payments. Because there's, a, there's an interesting right. synergy. So one of the areas that's, I think, is interesting from a disruption point of view is the synergy between, between payroll and financial services. Right. So, and this is where I think across the, across the world, there's going to be more and more disruption here. Because right now, what we have is we have a payroll, right? Which, if you think about it, is a sunk chunk of cash every month, right? Right. That's money that kind of the company owes me, right? Uh, but it's money that's sitting in the, in the, in the treasury provisions of the, of the company and come the end of the month or the end of the two weeks or whatever pay system you are, you receive your, you receive your payment. And for most of us, 75% of what goes from my payroll goes out the same day, right? When it lands in my bank account, it pays the mortgage, it pays the 400 subscriptions of various Netflixes, Amazon this, Amazon that, you know, um, you know, the money disappears, right? And so it's an extremely backward financial arrangement that the most that that the trillions literally trillions of dollars every month uh uh trapped in this payroll process and so i expect to see more and more interesting innovation on the bringing together a banking and 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 payroll um both in a large enterprise level you know we're seeing some of this already you know with with corporate cards and so on but i think there's there's all sorts of uh innovation opportunities in in um in in payroll in in rethinking payroll processing so you know if we think about where i'm more excited about ai is when we start to apply it to some of these traditional traditional processes um so i've seen some really cool cool uh, innovations in terms of integration technologies using ai so i can i can rapidly lower the friction between systems by using uh, AI to assist in integrate uh, integration, uh, design, and, and integration maintenance and integration operations, so this kind of resets the balance between between uh, best of breed and sweet. Because if I lower the costs of integration and I lower the and I improve the quality of integration, um, then I can allow I can be I'm able to deploy more best of breed applications, right? Um, so there's a whole lot of interesting things bubbling up at the moment um, on, you know, in HR tech. I, you know, I'm not seeing like, oh wow, someone's completely blown the whole model of HR on its head, and we won't be needing a workday or a whatever uh, in the future. A lot of interesting stuff, for instance, in remote work. Uh, you look at the growth of companies like Deal and 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 Oyster. We're an investor in Oyster, but you know, this this ability to work globally, uh, to spend you know, three weeks in the Bahamas and then four weeks in four weeks on 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 um you know on on Ibiza. You know, as a good friend of mine once said to me at 55, um, we've got about 30 summers left. We might as well double them. So the opportunity to 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 follow the sun, to work, to work in different places, to to make uh uh global mobility more more effective, uh simpler you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on, uh, going on, going on in those areas. There isn't yet, and I'm looking for it. I'm looking for, as an investor, I'm I'm dying to find the company that makes, you know, no offense to work in SAP, but makes them makes them irrelevant. But I've not yet seen the 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 concept that that does that. There are a few bubbling ideas, but we're not yet at the point where we start to see, you know, what could that alternative be. Uh, but it will come at some point. It will come. It's happened before, and it will it will happen again. Sorry, for the, will sorry be for the buzz. Sorry for the buzz kill, Brian, on that last point. Um, <laughs> just, just real quick, uh, programming note: uh, feel free to uh, put in your comments on big ideas in HR. I also pasted in a link to one of Thomas's deep posts on payroll, present and future. I recommend a look at that, Brian. Don't get don't get Brian started on payroll. I'm sure you have something that you I have an extra grind I want to get off my chest, but I don't want to stop you now that payroll's been brought up. So 
Well, I'm going to see the AI tool that actually automates the payroll to general ledger interface and generates all the accruals, automatically generates uh, reversals, does all of that and does it using AI and gets it right and tight in seconds every single pay period. That would be fantastic. And I think I'm I'm at, I I think the guy to speak to on that, we've not invested in this company yet. I, I think. Yeah, you know, perhaps one day we might, but but you should speak to uh, Jerome Gouvernel, the data scaler. Um, so Jerome Gouvernel at Data Scaler is doing some very interesting stuff. Uh, he's ex ADP, um, and um, and he spent a lot of time, you know, getting to grips with the nitty gritty of AI. And uh, he's able, for instance, to connect a multi, uh, you know, country payroll payroll from country A. To core HR system in country B, in in a very short period of time, like we're talking hours and days rather than the months and months and years that those kind of uh, those kind of activities uh, uh, that kinds of activities took place. So, so the I think these are the areas where I think AI is going to get very interesting. It's it's going to be some of these boring things, right? It's going to be some of these nitty gritty back end processes, but they don't get the initial high attention, but I think that these are the areas that are going to be going to be super interesting. Um, these are the areas where we're looking to fund. Is is sure we want to do. We're doing some very interesting, cool stuff. But for me, the 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 these administrative processes are precisely the place where 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 AI can be can be can be transformative and can bring a level of of accuracy. Now, it's not Gen AI. This is the point I'm making. So if you it, right. it, this is not fact, using Gen fact, AI. This is using AI. AI. In fact, if I may quote one of my favorite lines from your, one of your payroll blogs, hallucinating on payroll isn't cool. Uh, I think that pretty much sums up the Gen AI yep. payroll problem yep. pretty well there. Right. And, yep. and, I'm not, and I'm not advocating this is a Gen AI application, but this is a massive uh, time sink problem for corporate accounting and for payroll. And the, yep. worst, the worst environment is when you have a mid-sized company that has global operations all over the place because, you know, they don't even have to be terribly big and they may have a hundred different payroll providers in all kinds of yep. different countries. Yep. And, and you know it as well as I do, Thomas, uh, nobody necessarily gets everything right about the payroll run. And next thing you know, they're backing stuff back out. They're rerunning. They're doing all kinds of things. The yep. air question cycles are just those are maddening for people in accounting. Yeah. So there's yeah. that's an opportunity. It's more of a machine learning kind of problem more than anything else. It should recognize. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 so there's a pattern recognition. There's a pattern recognition sure. of, of nominee detection. Um, uh, there's 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 a whole bunch of work going on going on there, which is you know which is super which is super interesting. So the yeah, I was actually speaking to a startup today. I spoke to a cool startup this morning um, doing. So a couple of areas where I think there is innovation. So a couple of things where I'm super excited about is frontline technology that address the frontline worker. Mm-hmm. Right. So so HR technologies that we we all know and love, they've generally been designed by knowledge workers for knowledge workers. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, and so what? so so the frontline worker space is that there is a lot of interesting stuff going on. And maybe I'll, I'll I'll pick one up that I was talking to this morning. You know what they do is they look at. Um, uh, uh, machine, they're looking at machine repair issues, right? And they what they realize, what they know is that the 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 average age of a machine repairer, you know, who I'm talking about an industrial context here, who goes in and I'm not talking about fixing your washing machine, but I'm going in it's you know fixing the machine that prints the circuit board that goes in the Tesla, right? You know, you know that machine breaks down, the production line grinds to a halt. You know, I you know how do you you know, how do you correctly, you know, diagnose the problem? And, you know, part of it is the machine problem, but part of it's also the 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 uh, the human that's operating the machine. You know, how do we get the information out of that human? How do we how do we get that tacit knowledge, you know, out of the workforce and 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 make that into a more consumable, uh, combine it with machine diagnostics and so on. So some really interesting stuff going on at the frontline worker stage. We we invested in one company called AG5, uh, which is also frontline pay. Basically, you know, your big corporate HR systems got a whole bunch of skills data in there, right? You know, so Thomas knows 
English and German and Afrikaans, and he knows a bit about selling HR software, right? That's probably the most that you're going to get out of core core HR system about me. But the um, 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 the interesting stuff is if you're again in a factory, I don't care that you can work you, that you have uh, uh, print die experience. I want to know: Can you work machine number A on the production line? D- are you certified to work machine number A from 1952 on the production line? And so, what this company does is it, it's got a really cool tool for for the the shop floor, for literally for the line manager on the on the, the shop floor manager to make sure that the that the the right people are working on the right machine at the shop floor level in real time. You know, but so nowadays that's most organizations, even big companies. Yeah, you know, that's all in Excel, right? And so the idea then is you you use use a little bit of AI, but it's just a really cool, lightweight, uh, easy to use, mobile centric uh, uh, device uh, device based solution that that gives the shift manager complete control over over who's working on what machine, so that you don't have uh, doors flying off airplanes and stuff. You know, so so there's a there's a whole lot of Stuff going on in HR tech. There isn't this thing yet, like I said earlier, that blows that that blows the big guys out of the water. But it wouldn't surprise me if I see something in the next year or two that makes us go, "Geez, that that's the next big thing." Bonnie's curious about how you see AI changing the price model for these SaaS companies with less friction and more automation. It should bring costs down, right? Bonnie, I'm not sure we're going to see price discounting for AI anytime soon, but it's an interesting question. And I do think one thing I think that's been good about AI is uh, a renewed focus on different types of pricing models, including value-based and consumption-based pricing and things like that. Uh, Your thoughts, Thomas? Well, Brian, Brian's got Brian's got something to say first. Oh, sorry, Brian. Rarely does anyone talk over Brian, but I seem to I seem to have been able to manage it. Okay, I was actually going to reference Thomas's uh, comment to Bonnie's comment and say uh, uh, Thomas Ebernet's correct. Uh, Sridhar spoke about this in his keynote this week, and he talked about how the cost, he was just showing how with ever more powerful computing tools, how the cost of code and everything else keeps collapsing and and we're now approaching zero anytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how many companies are going to pass that savings on to their customers? I would say Zoho's on a pretty short list. There are companies that probably would. Well, true, but, uh, you know, anyway, that's another topic for a whole nother podcast. But, uh, but I'm acknowledging, uh, Thomas, that point. And there is a there is a real question here because uh, these AI tools can the generate ones can generate code they can generate test scripts they can do all this kind of stuff and get the you know, yeah. cost down. But anyway, that's enough. That's a side point. Yeah. So, anyway. so I think what's well, on that I think is a really good point is that we're going to see the the serious growth of of low code no code tooling deployed in 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 enterprise. Um, you know the the question for me is not re- what replaces your ERP systems, but what replaces the Excel. You know what replaces the world of Excel, and traditionally the world of Excel has been tried to be replaced by a couple of people developing a little SaaS application. You know they get you know five engineers and they build a nice SaaS application. That means you don't need you know you don't need your Excel for that process anymore, and that's that's all well and good. And then there will be still be those companies, but I think. Um, the tantalizing opportunity is the, the the return of the of a robust DIY capability. I mean, for instance, if you look at um, I've got no no connection with the company, but I've been spending a bit of time learn, trying to learn about AI myself, which is challenging given that given that I, I hated maths at high school and I haven't touched it since. So um, uh, you want a humbling experience is try and learn try and do some maths after thirty years. It does it does uh, yep. it does it does uh, change your same yeah, here. And you have to ask your kids when you have to after you after you, uh, you, know, you, have, to, you have to ask your kids how this stuff works, and they say, "Dad, this is so simple." Then, uh, and you got to learn. But anyway, anyway, what I was saying is, I've been using a tool called Data IQ, and uh, you know, if you look at this, you know, if you look at this kind of tooling, the power of the power that you can do from an analytics from an analytics perspective is is quite remarkable. Uh, you should get some of those people on the call, but um, um, yeah, the, I think the opportunities for 
quite sophisticated um, stuff within your own with your own within your own organization i think that starts to become more more realistic it's not going to be a nirvana but i think there's there's definitely opportunities for 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 uh um for for diy diy tooling you know and back to the pricing point of view there's i always differentiate between value creation and value capture right so so value capture is when you turn value creation into a pricing moment right and that's that's a factor of the of supply and demand of competition of 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 urgency and of all those of all those kind of kind of factors and right now the value the value capture in ai is going to nvidia right all right it's not in the it's not in the uh, um in the lightweight um it's not in the it's not like the saas vendors are are suddenly getting like mega profitable or whatever the 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 value flow is the moment is in the the value capture at the moment is in the is in the um is in the infrastructure layer now as as we start as that infrastructure layer starts to commodify we'll see the value capture move up into the into the into the application layer but at the moment we don't really know where the value creation is the value capture can be in the application layer so you know with the you know the nvidia hit 3 trillion had 3 trillion market cap uh uh this week so so that's where the money's going at the moment it's not going to the to the application vendors but at some point it'll swing you know it'll swing back you know historically again the early days of client server the hardware guys did really well and then that power then swung to the to the database vendors and then swung to the application vendors and we'll see the same we'll we'll probably see the same cycle you know emerging um emerging now yeah yeah so oh sorry go ahead Brian so i know we're we're going to be hitting the, the wall here on time. I really want to go into the future a bit more with Thomas while we got him. Yep. And, okay, cool. Uh, and, you know, Thomas, I could already see AI and generative, and generative AI in particular is already creating a lot of new problems for HR people when we've got job applicants who are using AI to write their, write or rewrite their resumes, uh, to write, um, Thank you letters to generate potential interview questions and responses, and 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 we've got uh, uh, job seekers using AI to apply to five thousand jobs in one week for one person. Yep. So AI is creating all kinds of new work and problems for HR people, and I haven't seen any vendors come up with any countermeasures or solutions to the new Gen AI created problems. Are you seeing anything coming up on your radar? Does anybody even talk about these kind of things? Because it yeah. seems like okay. Well, tell me. I'm, I'm, I want to hear this. This is this is yeah, gold. Yeah. If so, you got it. So we we made investment three weeks ago in a, in, to a company based out of Utah called SquarePeg, right? And again, aiming at at SME recruitment. But one of the we, one of the key capabilities in that product is to help is to help deal with the the wave of automated. Yeah, you know, automated applications that are hitting um, that are hitting SME. We did an investment in Fund One into a company called Copy Leaks, right? And Copy Leaks is probably today the leading plagiarism detection software. And what that's able to do is spot to a pretty good rate uh, examples of 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 uh, Gen A gener- generated writing. So even if you put it through three or four times, it can. It can still figure it out. It can also spot, which is very very important in the software world, spot generated code, because you know it's all very well. Gen- you know, hallucination in a hallucination in a document is one thing, right? Hallucination in some software code is a pretty scary, you know, scary thought. And so, you know, this helps identify that. Copy leaks has gone gangbusters. Uh, that's one to look at. But we're very excited about about SquarePeg. Um, you should check that one out. It's still very very early days, but mm-hmm. but. Yeah, we see we do sort of see some interesting, uh, definitely some interesting, um, definitely some interesting activity there. So I get there is there are a whole lot of negative externalities around around um, uh, around the usage of Gen AI in terms of privacy, in terms of in terms of hallucinations, in terms of discrimination, racism. There are a whole lot of issues that we have to grapple with 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 Gen AI in 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 HR. So one of the areas where I'm really keen to do investment in the moment is actually in 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 tools that help and i've looked at a few startups doing this 
tools that uh, that analyze uh, for um, legislative risk. So when you deploy an AI product, you know I want to know is this product compliant? You know where did the data come from? What 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 safety measures are in place? What guardrails are there? Does it meet standards in IST or or U, uh, EU AI Act, etc. 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 So so there's a lot going on at the moment to try and figure out you know the 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 to to help mitigate the negative externalities of of AI. But the stuff is still you know very early very early yep. stage of of fermentation. You know. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned code hallucinations because I don't, we don't have time for this today. But I take some issues with the developer efficiency conversation for that reason. Uh, I, I think I think it's a little bit overrated for that reason. Uh, I actually more excited about using Gen AI for business users to describe what they want out of applications and turn that into uh, relatively useful code that IT can then polish. But that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. Than and today. the other way, one one last example in payroll where where Gen AI is very useful is is, is in analyzing statute. Right. So, mm, so basically right. you, 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 you have like masses of regulations. You say, Hey, what, what's changed? You know, and if you've got a carefully trained, right. it's more of a, more of a, a small language model than it is of a large right. ma- language model. It might be an, a rag on the side of an LLM that is yep. trained specifically on, on legislative requirements. And so you can like, right. you know, analyze all the, you know, right. OSHA changes and tell me what's changed in OSHA from right. last year to this year. Or, you can train a model. Li- you can train a model literally on those regulations, and precisely, and, it, and that's where yeah, it gets. That's yeah. where it kind of gets super interesting. So I'm seeing a couple of these right. plays emerging as well, which is, which again is a great use case for Gen AI. All right. Okay, Brian. I want to ask Thomas a final question, then we're going to wrap. Um, my final question is the axe to grind I referred to earlier, which is I think a lot of focus of AI and Gen AI has been on improving uh, current the current circumstances of software and functionality, and I think. Some of that's useful, like you described the pain points around payroll, and I think that's a really good use case. But I think one of the big problems I've had with the big HR vendors, and it's starting to change a little bit, it, but it seems to me, it's not totally their fault, but it seems to me that the workforce has changed much faster than HR solutions have changed, right? So you have such a fluid workforce now, and people that, yeah. are, that are juggling multiple gigs, they want to get paid by the hour, they want to payroll that day, they want they want to juggle multiple companies. They want to have employee status and they want to be a contractor again. They want to go back and forth. Like, and it, it feels, it's not totally the vendor's fault, but it feels like the whole workforce is sped up to a point where vendors have had a hard time keeping up. Do you think that, is that a valid premise? And if so, do you think some of these startups are thinking like that? I mean, you refer to some of the international implications of that as well, which I think is the other piece of it. Yeah. I, I think you're, I think you're onto something. I mean, um, look, not every job is like that, and so we have to be careful that we don't. Right. You know, the, the world is not made up of software developers, right? So, right. Uh, you know, the the expectations of you know the expectations that we think of in terms of software if you're like a government employee, if you're a government employee or something, in your life isn't like if that. If government yeah. employee, then not a whole lot of change. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some work from home, or maybe some work from home options. There's been a, there's been some changes there, but you know, if you yeah, you know, if you want to get a great person on your show to talk. You know the changes in 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 workforce dynamics. Uh, Tony Yamas at Oyster is brilliant, right? Uh, you know he really looks at the whole. He he runs a company from he runs a global company. It's a Series C level company. Um, uh, you know, employing several hundred people, and it's completely remote. He lives on Cyprus, right? And and it provides global HR services around the world. You know, if you need software developers and they happen to live in Bulgaria, then he can make sure that they. They're, they're part of your company in, a, in an extended sense, but they're paid correctly according to Bulgarian taxation and, and whatever it is. Um, and he manages, that system manages all of that stuff. So it's a great example of, the, of this modern um, remote work um, uh, switch from contractor to employee um, uh, type, type uh, environment. But yes, I, I think the, the traditional vendors have not really embraced the, you know, so for instance, you take, Take SAP. They bought uh, uh, Field Glass ages ago. The, the levels of integration between Field Glass and and, and su- success factors are, 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 are you know minimal. Um, the if you look at you know if you look at Workday, they they bought Vindley, but they've not done a from where I'm sitting, they've not done a whole lot with it. Um, um, and so there's a work to do in terms of that in terms of thinking of that 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 broader extended workforce. That's that's for sure. 
Yes, indeed. Well, we'll leave it there for today. But Thomas, thanks a lot for getting in the hot seat to try to take some of Brian's uh, accumulated frustrations. And we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I and Apologies, Thomas. I had no idea that you'd been set up so hard thinking you were going to get manhandled by, yeah. by me. Everybody seems to think I'm going to be the bad guy today. But anyway, you got off all right. Uh, right. We, we, we love you, Brian. We love you. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Keep it up, yeah. Thomas. We'll track you on your blog and catch you next time. Cool. Same and uh, we should talk. We should talk again soon. Yeah. And pass my regards to Jason when you speak with him next. I, I will. I'll probably be speaking to him in an hour or so. So I will pass. He may him. even be watching. Him. He may even be uh, watching. Yeah. He did accept he the show. Invite. Watching, so. Okay. All right. Oh, gosh. He Later, may be watching. Well, great seeing you guys. Thanks Take for care. having me on the show. You got it. See you, Thomas. That's Thomas Sutter. Yep. Um, well, Brian, I don't know if we totally got big ideas in HR because that's that's a lot to ask of any one person. But I think we got some better ideas. How's that? We definitely got better ideas. So yeah, and I think he has some more. Um, let's say uh, he's got a very thoughtful and pragmatic way of looking at stuff from the way the you know another viewpoint of the market. And it's not the usual incrementalism kind of stuff we keep hearing from all the biggie enterprise vendors. So no doubt, no doubt. Thomas was just what we needed. So that was great. So John, looks like it's time oh, for man. time for the call for you to tell us the uh whiff what of the, the month. What, yeah, what the boneheads of the of the world did the last month. So well, this was a, this was a really good one because this was uh uh, I subscribe over at the independent outlet 404 Media, and they are just killing it over there. Um, Google is paying Reddit 50, 60 million dollars for Fucksmith to tell its users to eat glue. I mean, that's got to be one of the best headlines of the entire year. But ba- basically, uh, Google search, uh, you know, the new AI inline search, you know, recommended uh, non toxic, at least it was non toxic, non toxic mm-hmm. glue is a way to. Avoid uh, uh, the cheese sliding off your pizza at home. And the, John, the, you're a sucker for clickbait, but go ahead. Oh, you yeah. Love, you indeed. love good clickbait. You know, you know, someone actually did try to do it, too. Someone made a pizza and wrote about it. I, I think they even ate some of it, but that's I think they were fine. But they said it didn't taste very good. But anyway, the, the interesting thing about it is pertains to the training data is then some clever people went in and actually found the Reddit post where this idea was initially proposed that had mm-hmm. wound up in the training data and it was from a user named Fucksmith. So that's, that's mm-hmm. where the headline came from. So anyhow, that's, that's, a, that's a colossal whiff. It gets kind of back to a lot of what we were talking about. And then we had Canva redesigning work. One of the most infamous uh, keynote performances of all time. If I trusted video technology better, I would play a little bit during our show, but I feel like that's pushing the envelope. We had a couple tech issues earlier already, so I'm not going to do that. But if you get a chance, have a look at this. It definitely it, brought me great joy. Don't don't watch it on a full stomach. Uh, by the way, I was in a van full of uh, industry analysts this week. Herr uh, Vibernet uh, was one of them. And it was surprising on a bus we were on going to another you know, function for this vendor. What was everybody talking about? The Canva video. And um, so I'll just, let it, well, I'll leave the audience with the thought that you might want to check it out because it is without a doubt, the one thing you never want a vendor to do. Would that be a fair enough description, John? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I think the thing that fascinates me is all the small bad decisions that added up to one big epic <laughs> fail. Because so many people had to green light this at various stages in order for it to become reality. That's that's the beautiful thing. And I, I think I think the lesson here is that to me, the overriding lesson is that when you get drunk on your own Kool-Aid, you're gonna make a fool out of yourself. And it happens unfortunately too much. And you know, we we all are prone to that tendency, but that's why you have to get out more and make sure that your ideas get challenged before they wind up on stage. I'm I'm expecting this to become a marketing class case study that someone with Harvard Business Review is going to put together and it'll be something that gets taught in B schools all over the planet. Yeah. 
and I don't even know on that on that right hand article like what Seinfeld is doing in there, but like I don't either. Yeah, but it's just such a great graphic. Uh, and then Thomas says, "Did you hear the Google as well as Emma Spots currently do not answer questions regarding the EU par- Parliament election or the upcoming U.S. elections at all?" Yeah, so it's basically like you know I've said before that consumer search is the worst use case, but you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of sad. It's like, we're willing to settle for, for bullshit in exchange for that kind of convenient format. It's doesn't bode well for society. I don't think Frank Scavo says shades of vendor events during dot-com mania. Indeed. In fact, it was during dot-com that I saw a whole flourishing of vendors writing songs about themselves and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, those songs haven't aged very well, by the way, I think I still have one from Novell about netwear maybe didn't really hold up over time i don't have that on the old uh you know uh spotify playlist at the moment uh so let's see what do we got next brian uh, that may be about it uh, something that inspires big... creates value well man oh. talk about changing changing subjects <laughs> from <laughs> squandered resources and and epic fails uh what does inspire and create value brian uh, well, I, I think the customer wants to see prices go down, uh, but I'm not sure, you know, we were talking about, well, I don't think vendor anthems, you keep flashing that up, uh, are going to inspire or create value at all. But <laughs> Vendor anthems don't create value? <laughs> no, Come on, no but I'm going on record on that. The other thing that- By the way, hi, the- hi, Frank, nice to see you in the, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that really doesn't do it for me are vendors wasting money on chop keynotes. And again, we could do a whole podcast on why I don't like those. Uh, but I saw somebody get, did a transcript of one and I don't have a link for it or I'd share it right now. But this jock is talking about, uh, you know, it's doing every sports cliche there is about you're going to have, everyone's going to have to give 110%. We got to push this over the goal line. You know, it was on and on and on with this. And it was obvious this person had no idea what this tech company made, sold, or delivered. You know, so if you don't even know what the product is, you sure as hell can't create value. Um, but anyway, I, Sorry, I got off on a rant there. Uh, oh, no, no worries, man. Well, I just, at least I'm I, waiting until after Tom has finished. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's just that we haven't really answered the question. I mean, we, this is sort of, uh, maybe we should put it to the audience. What what inspired you or created value in the last month? Let's, let's hear. And please don't put like a vendor's product in the chat. Um, Please, please don't if do that. that. If you do that, I'm going to pull up that uh, yeah. video we did on aspire, uh, uh, astounding ERP. Of, astounding ERP, right? The um, only ERP that slices and dices and makes Julian fries out of your old backup tapes. Um, if you order this week, indirect access charges are free. And, um, so, uh, sorry that that refers to an old uh, public service announcement that Brian and I recorded back in the day. Um, that created value, Brian. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think Frank Scavo here even had to pull off the 405. He was laughing so hard when he was listening to that one uh, in real time. Um, anyway. Oh, it's Thomas. Yeah, he says the unconditional love that my dog shows all the time. In Indeed. Inspiration. Well, guys, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to grind on this stuff on the ai but tom thomas did a really good nice job today to talk about a number of the different ai capabilities the the things that i think we really need to be looking at are new ways of uh in fact let me back up i loved how i spent time with an, another investor who recently told me that we need to look at software companies on a very simple way who, you know, what is their number one priority? Is it the customer? Is it the prospect? Is it their um, end user that the software supposedly serves? Or is it their owner or investor, private equity firm? And when you look at a company and you see which one of those is their number one priority, boy, do you really get a clue as to what it's going to be like if you're going to become a customer of, the, of theirs. And, and, uh, um, <laughs> That's rule of GPT-40, that, that, Frank. That's, that's really low, Frank. Oh, my gosh. 
Frank Frank Scavo's having fun with us, Brian. <laughs> he says that GPT 4.0 is what inspires and creates value. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. All right. Oh wow! I, think, I, I see. We're at the age of we're at the point of diminishing returns. Yeah, I think it's time to oh. hang it up for this month. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I will just say I think like you know the the things that continue to like inspire are when when I find myself at events and you know it's the the kind of things where when vendors are creating an opportunity to have open discussions because. There's so much to learn right now. And, you know, I saw that at uh, the ASUC show where I was hanging about a bunch of executives and just hearing their raw views on what they're dealing with. And, you know, to me, if you can start there, then everything starts to make sense. And I think the risk we run is that we're so far into the automagical transformation stuff that we lose track of, you know, the pulse of what people deal with day to day. And so... To me, what inspires is is kind of hearing that. And even if it's the hard stuff, I want to hear it because the stuff that people are struggling with is exactly where to start. And, you know, one of the things I keep telling vendors is, why don't you churn AI on all of that stuff? Like, look at, churn AI on all the friction you create with your contracts and your licensing and your pricing. You know, in the age of AI, should anyone ever get audited again for software? Shouldn't they all have dashboards that tell them exactly what they're using and where any... Uh, potential cost or thing. Anyway, so the point is, like, like let's let's have those kind of conversations, and then we can all be inspired. And Frank says, Scarlett Johansson. Um, yeah, Frank. I, Google Scarlett Johansson if you haven't been tracking that one. Um, I'm not sure if that inspires, but it's well, certainly hot. It's uh, I I think as trending topics for sure. That's trending. Well, it's trending right now because that Chinese chat GPT thing uh, trained on her voice yep. and without permission. And uh, I, I suspect there's going to be some nice litigation coming out of that. Um, yep. And man, it's so hard to stay on something that inspires and creates value. That's why I like this slide so much. Like, <laughs> like to just stick on this topic is, is, is sometimes tough the way things are going. Anyhow, Brian, I think we've done it. Uh, thanks all for joining. Your participation makes a big difference. Sorry, we had a couple tech issues, but I think we got through. And you can expect to see us again next month for another edition of the Enterprise Month in Review. Thanks a lot. See you, Brian. Take care, everybody.